everyone. Welcome back to the Highland Hardwater Outdoor Podcast. This is Matt and Zach. Hey, everyone. Uh, we just got off the phone with Bernie Keefe. Uh, Bernie is from Granby, Colorado. Uh, he's been fishing in Northern Colorado for over 25 years. He both does ice fishing and soft water fishing. Uh, he's a fishing guide, a writer, and a blogger. Uh, he's also a member of the ice team. Uh, he's been featured on a number of television shows, and he's been a contributor on many magazines. Uh, it was a really great conversation. In this podcast, Bernie goes over some of his childhood stories of how he got into ice fishing, um, as well as regular soft water fishing. Uh, he goes over how he started guiding um, and how he started to guide ice fishing as well. And whenever he joined the ice team, he also goes over some tips for just getting into ice fishing as a beginner and some tips for early ice fishing for early in the season yeah it was a really great podcast uh we we're really looking forward to uh everyone uh taking a listen uh thanks again for everyone that has listened to the previous podcast we got a lot of a lot of great ones coming up uh make sure you leave a rating and review on itunes and share with your friends uh as we get uh, these conversations recorded we'll be releasing them out to you so uh, thanks again, everyone, and uh, make sure you follow us on Instagram. Uh, Highland Hardwater Podcast is the uh, handle on Instagram, and uh, everyone enjoy this podcast. So here's Bernie Keefe. We'd like to welcome Bernie Keefe back to the podcast. Uh, Bernie is from Granby, uh, Colorado, and he's been operating fishing with Bernie on Lake Granby and Grand Lake in northern Colorado for over 25 years. He is a fishing guide, writer, and a blogger, and he's also an ice team pro. He has been featured on a number of television shows and a contributor to many different outdoor and fishing magazines. Welcome, Bernie. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Great. So what are you up to right now? Right now, I am in the middle or just starting my fall fishing program. The fish are starting to, just starting to move. Think they're thinking about the spawning activity going on. And so we're still fishing deep right now, but we're getting ready to, fish are getting ready to move up on the shallower rocky humps and spawn, and we'll go mess with them for a while. Nice. What kind of uh, species are you targeting? Uh, mainly lake trout. 95% of my trips are lake trout. And then I do, we'll be fishing some salmon here pretty soon. Uh, rainbows and browns will be biting. So mainly it's a trout, trout and salmon bite. Nice, nice. That sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, it's, it's a hoot. It's, it's a hoot. And once, it, once the fall bite gets going, it's absolutely crazy. You, we're not fishing for the big fish when they're spawning. I like to leave them alone. But all the little ones that get on the spawning beds and just start eating the eggs, those are the ones we target. And we'll get... Oh, in the lake trout world, if you only catch 20 in an eight-hour day, I'll be apologizing, wondering why the bite's so slow, and they'll, they'll be 15 to 22 inches. Oh, wow. And so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. You go after them with lighter gear, like medium light rods and um, three-eighths ounce jigs, quarter-ounce jigs, stuff like that. So you get a good bend in the rod, um, and you get a lot of action. So it's just for me, it's it's one of my funnest bites of the year. Oh yeah, yeah, that sounds like a blast. And I bet you get some pretty good pictures out of that too. It sounds like a good day. Uh, we it's it's it, it's it's a hoot. It's it, there's nothing nothing better than going out and getting fifty or sixty bites in a day. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. That's great. Uh, and so, um, take us uh, back to when you got into fishing. Like, how did you get into fishing? Um, and then I know that you are, are really big into ice fishing too. So sort of when you got into fishing and then when ice fishing kind of turned into part of that too. I got into fishing at a real young age. I met my cousin and he started taking me to farm ponds in North Denver around the Westminster area. And we'd sneak into the farm ponds and the golf courses and um, all these private ponds being kids and back in the seventies, you could get away with hopping fences and we'd go catch bl- bl- uh, bluegill crappie and bass. And I got really stuck on it then. And then as I got older, as probably in junior high school where I started to hear about ice fishing. And so I would jump on that and I'd go out there with a, I didn't know anything about it, so I'd go out with a crowbar and punch through the ice. 
by the time I actually got a hole in the ice, I'd be soaking wet. I had no clue <laughs> to what I was doing. Never, I, I, it took me years before I caught my first fish. And then as we moved on, we started, I started get targeting trout and get, you know, getting augers and actually going about it the correct way as I knew it. And, um, started catching fish that way. And then I got really stuck on ice fishing. It became almost more important than open water fishing for a few years of my life. Um, and then I moved up here to Granby and it just, everything just really lit up for me. And I really became for lack of a better word, just completely addicted to fishing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, so when did you decide that you wanted to make a career out of it then? Oh, I was in, I was living up here and I really had no intentions of making a career out of it when I lived up here. My truck broke down one day and I brought it to the dealer, to the auto part mechanic guy in town, and he needed to put a new motor in it. And when I was going to pick it up he called me in his office and he goes hey i just bought an outfitter business you want a guide for me <laughs> and i go yeah that'd be great i go why are you choosing me when you got all these great anglers up here he goes quote you're the only one dumb enough to be out there <laughs> <laughs> nice. so that was that was my interview right there and um he's uh 15 years after that i ended up buying the business from him and doing it full time Nice, nice. That is really cool. And then well, you were talking so it's, about... It, it's a unique... Go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, you were talking about your um, your fishing with your cousin. Uh, any really great stories? Uh, any great catches that you had or um, any great stories? You know, it was just... it was the, the whole story was the big deal. It was walking through fields um kicking over logs and whatever was laying in the field and catching garter snakes and mice and frogs um going into these ponds and yet you know you had to sneak around because the farmers didn't like you out there (laughs) and the minute you saw them you had to run and you had to hop the fence and get on your bike and get away before they came yelling at you we never we never knew what they would do we always ran real fast (laughs) <laughs> we always assumed that they were running at us with a shotgun or something like that, which I think is completely false, but that was our assumption <laughs> that they'd be calling the cops. And right, right. We just had to vacate out of there as fast as we could. And so th- those are the memories, um, ducking and dodging and sneaking on places that really, I look back and I'm like, I'm glad I grew up when I could, when we could get away with that stuff and not end up in the police station. Yep. Yep. That sounds like a lot of fun. And we would take my, you know, we, my mom used to take us kids out every Saturday. She'd take whoever wanted to go in the neighborhood kids and we'd go to a, a lake somewhere, a town park. And a few times we talked her into going to some of these private places. And she learned real quick that she couldn't listen to us because once the people came, you had this 40 year old lady running across the field trying to get away from them. <laughs> <laughs> we got into a little bit of trouble over that because we had her convinced it was okay. But then eventually after about the second time, she's like, I'm not listening to you kids anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And so you said you know, that. We, no, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was say, we got in our trouble on the public ponds too because in city ponds in Denver, you weren't allowed to have rafts or anything. And we always brought a raft out and the cops would always come and talk uh, to her. Nice, yeah. nice. So, she was a very tolerant lady to let us get away with what we got away with. Yeah. So I was mentioning, so once you were, you were younger and you got into ice fishing, um, and then you talked about kind of using a crowbar and when, when did you start using like an auger or getting a shelter or starting to build up your ice fishing gear? So like you were more soft water earlier. And then, uh, once you got into, um, ice fishing, you kind of didn't have much. Uh, what did, what, how'd you do to build up the tools that you needed? Well, I was, I got the tools I needed when I got a driver's license. I went down to the local hardware store and bought an auger and that took all my money from me for that winter season. So I'd get an auger and we'd go fishing, but we'd use our long poles. 
because we didn't have anything else. We'd use half a pole, stuff like that. Hmm. And then we eventually got into buying whatever ice rods we could find. And back then in the Denver area, there wasn't much. It was real tough. You ended up using broken rods and stuff like that. So the auger was the first part. And I honestly, I didn't get a hut until, oh, I was moved up here. So I had to have been... 25 years old before I could afford one, we would walk out on this, we'd walk out on like say Granby and we, I had the mentality of you had to hand auger through at least 20 holes before we got into fish. Hmm. And I'd see all the guys on snowmobiles with their power augers and fish finders and huts. And I'd go, wow, those guys are really lazy. <laughs> that was just my way of justifying my brokenness and I yep. couldn't afford anything. And, um, then as time went on, I slowly started to get all the other stuff. I remember the snowmobile was my first, or no, the fish finder was my first purchase. And then a snowmobile was next. And then I got a gas auger and it still took me a few years before I could afford a hut. And then once I got a hut and I had a flip over hut, life was good. Life was really awesome. I could go out there. I could have heat. I could fish in blizzards. I could be comfortable. And I, I, all them lazy guys weren't lazy anymore. They were really smart. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, those huts make all the world a difference. <laughs> Keeping the heat in. Oh, they do. It, oh, it's incredible. No, no more frostbite. No more <laughs> anything. Yep. So then uh, how long after uh, doing a lot of ice fishing did you decide to guide or, or become a guide? Oh... I'll bet you it was, I'll bet you it was only four or five years. And then when I got that offer, I just had to say, okay, I want to, I want to give this a shot. And when I, when he hired me, my only goal was to be able to afford a trip or two to Wyoming to go fishing every year. And, um, within a couple of years of that, I realized, wow, I can also afford to get a couple of new rods every year. And then within a few years of that, I was, I got a new boat and, and I was getting all new tackle all the time. And it was really, really an amazing, an amazing leap of what was going on. I couldn't believe how fast things were moving. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. So were you, so did you but start I, as an ice guide or uh, both? Um, I started in a boat. Okay. By the time he hired me, it was my first trip was in a boat. I remember that, and um, and then it then it went on that that following winter. I was on the ice guiding. Cool. And it wasn't it wasn't nothing real busy. It was just I probably did seven or eight trips in the boat that first year, and four or five trips on the ice. And then I got into a couple of magazines. At the time, I was about the only fishing guide in Colorado who was trying to promote it and getting a hold of magazines and other things like that and TV shows. And so I was about the only one doing that. So everybody was eager to see what this fishing out west was. And so it was real easy to promote myself. And I learned a lot of lessons, good lessons in that whole thing about working hard and promoting yourself um, and the whole honesty thing, how well it works for you. So it was a, it was a great catalyst to my career. Yeah. I was going to ask you, um, so you got that job um, and then you were guiding. How did you learn more and, and, and uh, hone your skills in order to be on those magazines and television shows? I mean, uh, once you got that job, then, did you just start learning by, by practice and learning what, what works and what doesn't work? And then you could just use that, uh, to build up your expertise. Well, I was, I was fishing and guiding on one of the best lake trout lakes in the state at the time. At the time it was probably the best and, or let me not, let me not say the best, but the most well-known and, um, so once word got out that I got to be a guide, all I ever did when I moved up here, I just started fishing almost exclusively on Granby and I'd fish it every day. 
after work. Um, I remember one time after work, I got off work, I came home, I lived in a trailer. I came home, I had some fish fillets from the day before. I threw them, I, I, took, I turned the grease on and I went and used the restroom and I heard this little puff. And I'm like, huh, my um, house is on fire. And I finished reading the article that I was reading and I came out of the bathroom and I looked up and it, it was, the grease was on fire. And so I threw the grease, I, I went and grabbed the cast iron skillet and I threw it out the door and I thought, wow, there goes my dinner right there. And so I hopped on the snowmobile and went back out again. Um, and that's kind of what my life was. Nothing really yeah. interfered with going fishing, um, including a big burn mark in my trailer. That was, that was <laughs> yeah. not a big deal. <laughs> um, and that's kind of how it went on. And, I learned so much just by being out there every day and fishing with my buddies and paying attention and being real diverse and fishing for everything in the lake that I could. And that really went on. And then I met a guy named Terry Wickstrom at one point, and he taught me a whole bunch about the promoting, promoting everything around you and yours will come. And he gave me connections to people and I'm just conversations with him. I learned so much. And then down the line, a whole bunch of other people just kind of added to, to how you, to how you, how you fish and how you promote yourself. And it really worked out well for me. Nice. Nice. So did you have any uh, mentors then, or it seems like it was mostly just self-taught? Most of it was self-taught. I would say nice. Terry Wickstrom was a mentor in the, uh, was a mentor in the promoting thing. Um, the, the read, the local biologist who is now retired, Jake Bennett, he taught me a lot. And a lot of the guys who lived up here who I was able to fish with just, they all taught you just a little bit mm -hmm. Yep. because they all fish different and you were able to, you were able to mesh it into your own way, your own style. But I would say most of my fishing, I learned by just trial and error and being out there. I remember the biologist once told me, I told him when I was catching, he gave me a tagging gun. And um, he goes, tag, tag fish that you catch. And so he goes, but I don't think you're doing what you're doing because you're doing everything. You're not, you're not doing the right techniques in the right spots. Huh. And then when I turned in my tags at the end of the season and he saw all the numbers I had written down and along with the pictures that he wanted, he was like, huh, you got something going. You turned in more tags than anybody this year. Nice. And so, so, I was, so to this day, it's, it's a funny lesson I learned with that. Whenever I see somebody in a spot that I don't understand, I, I don't think, wow, they're not catching anything. I always think, I wonder what they know that I don't. Mm, yeah. Because that's how I started this. Everything I, was, everything I was doing was wrong. Yeah, that's awesome. Keeping that open mind I, I with a, that. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's a good learning thing to pay attention. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, so when did you get started with the ice team and how did you get connected with them? I started with the ice team. It would probably be 2004, 2005. Okay. And, um, Terry Wickstrom got me on the, as a power stick on the ice team. Nice. And from there, I was just turning in my, my quarterly reports, my annual reports. I was sending him emails and pictures and in probably around 2008, 2009, they invited me on their pro staff. And then it just kind of blew up from there. Cool. And then, so... The thing about it is when, when people want to get on these staffs and they get just a little bit of their foot in the door, it's up to them to go further and make sure you communicate with the people and send them your reports. And if you're lucky, they'll need somebody to do an in-store for you. And that's where it all takes off. Got it. Yeah. So <clears throat> we have probably some listeners that maybe do some soft water fishing and maybe they do some ice fishing. Uh, but for anyone that uh, is getting into ice fishing, what sort of tips do you have in getting started in ice fishing? I mean, they can kind of go baby stuff, maybe your story from earlier when you, kind of saved up for different tools and things that you could have, but, um, any tips or, or tricks from maybe what you learned for people that are looking to get into ice fishing? 
there's so much information out there on the internet now that you have that you didn't have when I started. A little bit of research on the internet will teach you a whole bunch because it's all it's so it's so regionally specific. And if you just sit there and like you guys are in Cleveland, if you sat there and did a little bit of it research, you would find out that the ponds have bluegill in them, and that'd be a great place to start. And then mm, the yeah. tackle you need is not very much. But I would say the biggest thing you can do, the biggest tip I can give is research your local area, and then as you're starting to get gear, you can get used gear, and you can, that was something I did not know about, you can get, you can buy used gear, in decent shape and you can get into it fairly inexpensively and um just pay attention and learn pay attention to what you're doing your failures teach you the most Hmm. yeah and then what would you say about uh the growth of ice fishing uh maybe even in colorado or even nationally of since you're on the ice team as well you probably speak to a lot of people that are in the minnesota and the ice belt um what would you say about uh, the growth of ice fishing or how to grow ice fishing? Oh, the growth has been unbelievable. Uh, From 20 years ago when you wouldn't see a lot of people on a Saturday on the lake to now on a Saturday on Lake Granby, anyway, the parking lots are full. Um, Anywhere you can pull off on the side of the lake, everything's full. You have up to a thousand people a day out on the lake. Um, It has grown seminars every weekend. There's a seminar somewhere. The the St. Paul Ice Show, if you haven't been there, is absolutely phenomenal. That'll let you know how big ice fishing really is. And, you know, it's just going to keep growing because it's a complete, it's a sport that the whole family can do. A guy can go do it on his own. You can take it to whatever level you want to take it. You can go fish target trophies you can go try to catch dinner you can just go sit on the ice and have a great day and not catch anything um so i think it's one of those sports and you don't need it's a it's a very inexpensive sport to go do you get yourself a hand dogger and a short rod and you're good you can go you can you got a hundred dollars invested into this and you can go all winter long yeah absolutely what do you what do you think uh is contributing to the growth of the sport I think the the people promoting it, like everything Clam does, is absolutely phenomenal to grow mm-hmm. the sport. Um, these podcasts, stuff like that, and then it's the the biggest thing I think is it's so easy for people to do, and people are learning how easy it is to do. And the biggest piece of knowledge they need to know is when it's safe and when it's not. And yeah. if people just you know teach that then they can go out there and they can learn because there's always something biting underneath the ice. And um, if you learn when them good times are, like first and late ice, then you can go out there and you can catch fish and have a great time and be excited to go again next time and bring your kids out there with you. And the kids start catching fish. They want to go. And I think as far as families goes, the kids are the big drivers. Would you say there's a, a, since you guide both in the summer and in the, in the ice season, what are the main differences in uh, technique and, and being good at being an ice fisherman compared to being a softwater fisherman? The, the main technique differences, that's a good question. I got to think about that for a minute. Um, I think the biggest deal is you got to be comfortable. You got to be able to stay warm out on the ice. And then for the got techniques, it. it is being able to, know when to move and know how to move um the presentation the good thing about the presentation is you can drop something down the hole and move it or not move it and fish are going to swim by and if you're paying attention you're you're going to get bites either moving it or not when they're aggressive in the morning they're going to swim by and eat it and once you start learning that then you're going to learn, okay, a little more movement, a little less movement or something like that, a little different place in the water column and I'll catch more fish. Nice. It's pretty simple. And along those lines, um, are the techniques a little different early in the season as, um, instead of late in the season, like are the fish a little more active when it's a little warmer early in the season or how does that technique change if at all? The fish are definitely more active on early ice and late ice. In the middle of the ice, middle of the season, 
the oxygen lower levels are a little lower. The fishing pressure got to them. Um, everything's going on. It just puts them in a kind of a neutral to negative mode. So early and late ice is when you can go out there and you can do really well and you can fish even a little bit more aggressively. Gotcha. Nice. So what do people need to be thinking about in that early ice uh, in order to be successful? Well, if you're a trout fisherman, early in the ice to be successful is you don't need to go venture far from shore. You don't need to venture a long ways. And one of the big things to remember is they stock trout right off the boat ramps. So if you fish around the boat ramp, you, there will be trout there. They move in. The, the hatcheries have the trout all screwed up because they have them spawning all year long so they can keep the waters and the fish in the water. And so there's always going to be trout moving into the boat ramp trying to get that, trying to find that rocky, gravelly area to spawn on. And so if you fish around them, you'll probably do pretty good and um, for the first two, three weeks till everybody beats it up, and then you'll have to go venture out. But I would say the biggest things don't fish too deep don't fish far away from wherever you're parking fish the boat ramps um and then go out there and learn from that yeah nice those are some good tips um so do you have a favorite species to fish for um for soft water and ice fishing um or is it the same what's the most fun minor my 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 favorite species is lake trout. That's kind of, nice. I've been fishing them for so long and I'm still, they're a fish there. You just can't figure them out all the time. So you always have to be, you always have to be working out there and you'll get on a little pattern for a little while, then they'll see it and they'll shut down. So you're always changing stuff. Um, you're always changing your technique, your lures, something along the line. And there's always something going on the lake that you don't know about. And so it's your job to go figure out what it is and how to, how to capitalize on it. Yeah. Uh, what kind of lures and bait do you usually use for lake trout? I use a lot of tube jigs. I'm a, I'm a tube jig freak for lake trout. Oh, nice. And they'll go anywhere from three inch bio bait tubes all the way up into, we make some seven and eight inch tubes. Um, uh, that's probably my, my whole, 80% of my fishing trips, I'm, I'm using something to do with a tube jig. Oh, okay. Cool. And then uh, we were looking on your website and saw that you kind of have a, a recipe section. So what is your favorite fish to eat and um, any really good recipes? Well, I got to be honest with you. Walleye and perch would be my favorite fish to eat. There's no question about that. And I, years ago, I fried fish on the lake for every fishing trip on the ice and we'd go out there catch fish and I'd fry them out there on the ice and that was phenomenal but I got burned out on fried fish and to this day I'm not a fan of fried fish anymore <laughs> so I love grilling fish a little bit of olive oil salt and or um, lemon and butter lemon and pepper seasoning and then a lemon slice on top of the fish those fish are so good when you grill them that way awesome cool so uh yeah, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, any, you want to give a shout out to places that uh, people can find you? Um, I know uh, www.fishingwithbernie.com is one of them, but any other uh, ways that people can contact you? Facebook, Fishing with Bernie, Instagram, Fishing with Bernie, uh, YouTube, Fishing with Bernie. Uh, you can get a hold of me through all those. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, thanks so much for being on. Yeah, thanks, Bernie. Hey, guys, thank you very much. I hope you guys have a safe winter. Thanks. You too.